So good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to be with you in in one more uh, Sai Cafe Colloquia talk. It's a great pleasure to have uh, this on this week's uh, Colloquia talk, uh, Professor Michael Saliba. I'm going to give a short introduction about Professor Saliba, a short bio. He has uh, his uh, he has his bachelor degree in mathematics and physics at the University of Stuttgart, PhD from the University of Oxford. Um, in 2014, and he was one of the first um, uh, PhD holders uh, in metal halide perovskites under the under the supervision of uh, Professor Snyth. Uh, then he moved uh, for his postdoctoral um, position under Marie Curie grant in EPFL in Lausanne under the supervision of another um, innovator in the field of uh, dye sensitized solar cells and perovskite, Professor Gratzel. In 2018, he was accepted as a group leader position, as a group leader at the University of Fribourg. And in 2019, he moved to DU, the University of Darmstadt in Germany as a professor. Since 2020, he's the head of the Institute of Photovoltaics at the University of Stuttgart. His research includes, his research includes chemistry, energy research, physics, material science, new materials, environmental engineering. His work has received so a lot of distinctions. Um, Times, for example, Times Higher Education uh, uh, list, uh, listed Professor Saliba as the third most influential scientist in his field. He belongs among the top 1% of the most cited scientists. According to the MIT Technology Review, he's among or he was among, because you know the time is passing. Uh, the most 30 on, on the top of the most uh, innovative scientists under the age of 35. His work has received more than 32,000 citations and his age index is 64. Uh, today he's going to speak to us about the versatility of perovskite materials for optoelectronics. It's a great time to see you again, Michael, and the honor for our institution, for us, it's great. So the floor is yours for the next 40 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Costa. So let me um, share my presentation. Okay, so you should be able to see it now. Can you yeah, see yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, good. So let me, first of all, uh, thank you, Costas, Manos, and Georgios, of course, for this kind invitation. Um, I know I've known Costas for a long time, in a way, since 2000 and maybe 11 or something like that, 12. Because there was a famous, now famous summer school in Crete every year. One of the highlights, it went for like a, two, a full two weeks. It was incredible, you know, so with a lot of lectures and stuff like that. But so he introduced the beautiful culture in, in yeah, Greece in general, let's say. Um, and uh, I think it really created a, a sort of the sense of community as well. So this is really to your testament, Costas. You really influenced a lot of people in this way, which is to show uh, when you organize a lot of stuff, uh, this can have influence many years down the line, even if you don't expect it. So thanks a lot for that, and I will always treasure that memory. So let me uh, jump into the talk, and I'll I'll try to make it sort of in a relaxed fashion. So you know, uh, there are lots of slides. I will skip over some of them, and then if you have questions, you can just jump in. This is more of a of a general overview talk of my activities. So. Uh, let me first of all thank the true heroes of this work who conducted uh, a lot of the research that I'm going to present uh, throughout my different stations, be it Jülich, Darmstadt, uh, Stuttgart, but also Fribourg, and then I'm also drawing back to some of the works I've done uh, during my time at EPFL and Oxford University as well. So just to give a very, very rough overview over the Institute for Photovoltaics at Stuttgart University, I've only switched there um in june 2020 it feels like a long time ago because of COVID, but it's only been uh, two years ago actually one and a half years and um, we are sort of centered a lot around uh, silicon technology with the add-on of perovskites now as well and uh, we are sort of dealing with uh, aspects of the technology industrial processes lasing and sensorics of uh, silicon but then also we we have a second group which is embedded within the chair of the Institute for Photovoltaics uh, dealing with energy storage, which is a very common topic, let's say. And um, you may recognize some of the names, uh, but we have like a lot of group leaders taking care of individual subjects. I'd like to point out, for example, the high performance solar cells that we, we are looking at under Stephanie Essig, 
who's um, like an expert on multi-junctions, so, which is a very obvious topic for uh, perovskites. And you see here, this is pre-corona, a picture of the Institute. We are uh, at the moment uh, 40 plus people uh, in the heyday. Uh, in the 70s, it was even more than that, towards 80. But I think the size at the moment is already quite good. Um, so then let's jump right into it. Uh, although the intro is probably not needed for most of you, let me uh, briefly sort of uh, talk about the fascination in terms of these uh, perovskite materials. It's a three component system resembling this uh, piece of stone here. Yeah, uh, this is called a perovskite. It's named after a person here, Perovsky. Uh, it was discovered, this mineral in the 1830s yeah, by this German person. And he named it after this uh, noble person, a Russian guy. Um, because this is how it was done back in the day. He gave the money. He also got to keep the name in his honor. And usually this isn't a big deal. There are thousands of minerals, uh, sort of or hundreds in this way. But this became the namesake of any structure that resembled the calcium titanate lattice. So any structure called ABX3 is, is called a perovskite. And uh, this sort of like uh, crystallographic, let's say, classification uh, encompasses a huge material group. So if you type in perovskite, you can see how it goes up, up, and up. Yeah. So the high temperature semiconductors are, uh, sorry, superconductors are uh, perovskites as well. Um, barium titanate, very famous uh, ferroelectricum, is a perovskite as well. So this is in, in many ways, uh, like let's say, a big marketing um, sort of scheme which has evolved over many decades now. But the perovskites we're talking about for photovoltaics are the ones which have a more specific uh, compositional uh, makeup. And you see it here where the A component is uh, cesium, um, methyl ammonium, the molecule here, or former medinium, which is the molecule here. And then the metal position in these octahedra are uh, most commonly lead or tin. A lot of good research is being conducted on tin-based perovskites as well. And then these corners, these corner positions are occupied by uh, halides. So this is what we talk about. This is sort of what uh, became relevant for the field. The, they became very interesting. You see it here, these colloids, um, because uh, they can be tuned from 400 to uh, 1,050 nanometers by exchanging the different components. So starting from cesium lead trichloride, the violet, and then uh, towards the infrared, uh, resembling more the band cap of uh, silicon, tin and lead mixtures uh, together with iodide um, is pushing the band gap there. And this is interesting because it's low temperature processable, inexpensive earth abundant materials, high quality semiconductor from a solution. And because it's a direct band gap material, it has a high absorption. Therefore, it only requires uh, like a flexible substrate. So a very thin layer is already sufficient to absorb a lot of light. And the fabrication can be done in a wet chemistry lab instead of a clean room. So this is really something it's more like the story that is being told about organic electronics. You know, this is more like something that uh, Thomas Antopoulos would talk about, let's say. So this is sort of the style of these materials. And so they, and indeed, they resemble a lot of the properties uh, from organic electronics. And because it's a semiconductor, yeah, silicon is a computer chip, it's a solar cell, you can do many things with a semiconductor. And in the case of perovskites, demonstrations have been shown for LEDs, single photon sources for quantum computing. So this is something that is part of the graduate school uh, in Stuttgart, for example, where we investigate uh, perovskite colloids. Tunable lasers have been looked at, memory effect as well, high power per weight application, interesting for drone applications, for instance, or any other um, sort of application where weight plays a role building integrated photovoltaics. And then here, finally, the secret of the Kinder surprise has been revealed as well. Uh, X-ray detection is also interesting here. I'll, I'll talk about some of these topics later on. And here, so this is sort of what put perovskites on the map. Um, this is a very busy uh, graphic. Most of you know it already. This shows all the world records uh, for like any kind of size for any material uh, reported. And here you see it here, this yellow, uh, uh, sorry, this red circle with the yellow interior are uh, the perovskite materials which came up recently. And uh, within uh, like a very short time, they really broke all the record books. You see it here in a zoom out as well. It took silicon four decades and perovskites went from 3.8% in 2009 all the way to 25.7% now, which is a really unprecedented story. Very few materials uh, have uh, broken the 25% barrier. 
I think perovskite is only the third material uh, to date that has reported such performances. And I think this is sort of what made uh, people very interested in this. And you see it here. So I stopped in 2019 to count. But nowadays, it's about 10 papers per day on this topic. When I started the PhD, when I was in the summer school in Crete, there was like one paper on the whole thing. One paper, yeah. And now it's 10 per day. So it's very difficult to follow. But also, it shows how many uh, groups are interested in this topic, which is exciting, of course. And then, uh, since uh, this is a Greek audience, let's talk about the uh, ancient history. <laughs> Not so ancient as Greek history, of course, but in 1893, uh, already one of the first publications was shown very interestingly. So this was reported. Uh, then it was continued in 1958. So I like to show this paper as well, uh, but talking only on the fully inorganic version, cesium lead trichloride, for example. And here, this is the full nature paper as well. Yeah, so this is nice. So this is how it used to be. And then finally in 1978 at the University of Stuttgart, as it happens, the first organic inorganic embodiment of this uh, structure, methyl ammonium lead triiodide was published. You see it here, um, where a lot of uh, the mixing concepts for the halide position was already uh, looked at. And you can see here how this paper was gone unnoticed and now all of a sudden people uh, started accessing it and also uh, obviously must have learned how to read German papers as well because this was written in German back in the days. So you can see this is this has been a very interesting development uh, historically as well. And this is interesting because um, also uh, uh, George Papa Vasilio, Greek researcher, who I think passed away just recently, um, also did a lot of research on this from the 80s onwards. And it, it serves to show this was more of like a speciality field, let's say, you know, for basic research. And then people always ask, why do you do it? You know, where's the application? And now you see four decades later, this is, I mean, how research works. There is an application all of a sudden, but all, all the pieces, you know, were needed. Uh, and this, I mean, serves to show sort of the proverb of Newton, you know, you need to stand on the shoulders of giants in a way. So the, due to all of this research, it was possible to access it so easily later on. Then uh, let me make it super clear how these are processed. So this was done this video was done during my time at Oxford University, and you see how this is really made from a kind of ink you know, process, in this case, why spin coding, and then already forms the photoactive layer, the semiconductor is already finished, which is different from epitaxial growth, for example. And you see here um, these um, sort of uh, Materials are suited for flexible substrates because it's a direct band gap semiconductor. It can be suspended on the soap bubble, for example, so it's lightweight. And then also roll-to-roll -roll processing is uh, of interest as well. You see it in this figure here. And this is one of the big uh, directions people look at printing, let's say, as a, let's say, uh, rubric. How do you print things? And all of a sudden, you can apply it to solar cells. And then this, uh, the second very big topic is, of course, Silicon already has a huge lock-in effect. 95% of everything solar is now silicon. It's so cheap, unexpectedly actually, but it, it's become so cheap. And uh, silicon cannot be improved any further, not easily at least, because it's reaching its natural threshold, the shock equalizer limit. And improving silicon by putting a thin perovskite layer on top would be one possibility in this tandem approach to, to improve, to, to um, push the boundary in terms of efficiency of silicon. And here, perovskites as a high band gap semiconductor could become relevant. And a lot of research is, of course, going into this direction. And this, of course, uh, makes it possible to go for highest efficiency multi-junction solar cells and could become relevant for concentrator or even space applications as well. So this opens really a new horizon, both as a standalone solution, but also as a silicon kind of solution. So much, let's say, for the motivation of the field. Then moving onwards uh, towards uh, sort of uh, the science that I've conducted for a long time that we're looking at. And there, one big question is, how do we stabilize these perovskite materials? Because, you know, they are sort of made from like a low temp temperature process and they have multiple phases as well. And one big question is, how can we get them stable at room temperature for a long time? Because mind you, the silicon is stable for many, many de decades. So if you want to put a material on top, it also needs to be at least as stable, let's say. And here, one useful empirical metric is the so-called tolerance factor, 
where the ionic radii of the three components of this perovskite are put into relationship to one another. And just to give you an idea, a tolerance factor of one means that all the different spheres within this uh, unit cells are touching one another. Yeah, so this is T equals one. And empirically, it was discovered that a tolerance factor between 0 0.8 and 1.0 uh, gives a black face or like an, an alpha face, which is photoactive. And these are sort of the typical 3D materials people look at. And if we sort of use this equation and uh, use these as boundary conditions, tolerance factor between 0 0.8 and 1, it means that the cation which can fit here has to be about 2.7 angstrom, let's say, around about. So there are not many materials which can fit here without distorting the overall lattice uh, structure. Then, of course, at the same time, being close to the boundary of the empirical relationship means we introduce polymorphism. So the coexistence of multiple phases, and these phases for simplicity, uh, I mean, the, the photoinactive phase is called a delta phase, but uh, we, we refer to it as a black, a yellow phase because of its color. And we see it here, cesium that triiodide, which has a tolerance factor of 0 0.8, has two phases at room temperature. Unfortunately, this uh, yellow phase, and then only at higher temperatures going beyond 300 degrees, um, all of a sudden a black phase emerges. And now the question is, uh, how can we make this uh, sort of exist at uh, room temperature already? And you can see why we call it yellow and black phase from, from this image. So then the, the goal for us is and then uh, the bigger question is, how can we, can we use this tolerance factor to sort of get an idea of what is a stable and what isn't a stable material? And in this uh, graph, the graph here, it's a function of the tolerance factor over the ionic radii. The lead iodide position is fixed, so the, sort of the second and the third position, because this gives the most redshifted possible band gap, which is beneficial for solar cells. Of course, it could be uh, other components as well, but other components don't, um, don't have the band gap that we require for, uh, for photovoltaics. And you see it here, there are only three known cations which uh, fulfill this relationship of being between 0 0.8 and 1.0 in terms of tolerance factors, only cesium, methyl ammonium, and former medinium, and nothing else has been reported since the 1980s. And it's because the, the space is so tiny. When we go larger, here, for example, imidazolium, ethyl amine, or guanadinium, it, it isn't a 3D perovskite anymore. So the octahedron separates from one another, the metal halide layers become distinct from one another, and we have what is uh, called a 2D perovskite. If we go to small, the possibility of collapsing. So for example, the other alkali metals from sodium to rubidium are too small. So then we only have these uh, three. We, we tried very badly to find others, but we haven't yet. So if you have an idea uh, for like a small molecule which can fit, we would be all ears. And you see here, the way to get around this is to start mixing them, you know, to, to get like an effective cation radius by using two uh, of the species. So this was uh, done for a long time. And then by starting to mix these in a systematic way, this was sort of, this will be the big theme for this segment of the talk. You see it here, one thing uh, we've done in terms of research was to mix uh, the three existing ones together, motivated by these double cation perovskites, but then also to look at smaller or larger cations to, to be included in very small quantities within this material. And just to give you an idea, these are the most recent ones. Well, as you can see, see even the number is, uh, is very close to 30% now. It's only a question of time until this goes uh, further. And here, 25.7% in terms of um, sort of the single junction record is also, in my opinion, only a question until it breaks the silicon record as well. And it also has the potential to even go higher towards single junction of gallium arsenide, which is not sufficient material. And you can see how all of these materials, they use lead, they use antisolvent and uh, methyl ammonium former medinium mixtures most of the time. And so one thing we started looking at was what would happen if we use the most uh, efficient uh, material at the time, uh, methyl ammonium and former medinium, so a double cation perovskite. How does it look like actually in terms of its uh, cross-sectional SEM here? And what happens if we add a small component of a cesium to form a triple cation perovskite? So this was sort of the, the idea of a new design principle. Can a small quantity of cesium improve MAFA? And of course, I put it very suggestively. The answer is yes. Uh, what we've observed was 
that without cesium, these metal ammonium form aluminium perovskites uh, require annealing. They have impurities on the X-ray, which is something we show in, in this paper here. And uh, with cesium, all of a the sudden, the, these small yellow phase impurities uh, visible on the X-ray uh, disappear all of a sudden. And but this gives a bigger hypothesis that, that the presence of cesium makes the perovskite formation less sensitive. So. Uh, Without cesium, there are many crystalline precursor states which are difficult to control. But the presence of cesium pushes it directly into the black phase, such that the formation can start from the correct phase to start with. And that's a very important uh, issue because it explains the sensitivity or some of the sensitivity of these materials. Because it's very difficult to process perovskites uh, even in a glove box atmosphere. Because the atmosphere itself is exposed to the solvents that are required to crystallize this material. So it's uh, challenging to get a repeatable result. But by adding the cesium, we could see that the, the correct phase was used from the get go. And this was uh, useful in terms of re reproducibility down the line. And um, this is just like a side result. But uh, by adding larger amounts of cesium, uh, because this already forms at room temperature, it gives idea a rise to the idea of a solar paint where already the correct phase is formed from the very beginning. So I, I think for this audience, I can skip over this slide. This is sort of uh, the device parameters to measure the efficiency of a solar cell uh, to cut the, the story short by adding a small amount of cesium for these triple cation perovskites. A lot of the devices started to break the 20% threshold at the time, and very importantly, the standard deviation went down as well. You see it here, it was very mixed, and then only by um, adding the cesium, all of a sudden the spread in terms of data variation went down a lot. And also, this data set was uh, sort of collected by three different people, showing that it's not sort of uh, specific to a person, which is also important, of course. And here you see how the performances were stabilized at 21.5, uh, 0.1%. And uh, even in terms of long-term stability, it was extremely stable, only dropping from 18.5 to 18% um, for 250 hours of uh, exposure. And uh, we could also later on reveal that there's an, in, in, an initial reversible loss component, as, as well, which um, has to do with uh, sort of the ion migration within the material. This can be recovered, and this is a very hot debate at the moment as well. So then, and it's written in the last sentence of the conclusion of the of this paper, that this opens also the prospect for all the other alkali metals, including, for example, potassium, but also rubidium. And that's something that a lot of people started looking at. Maybe that there is space for a triple or multiple cation um, approach. And why the alkali metals? Because they are plus one stable. I mean, almost by definition, by being in the first group. Um, but the issue is only cesium uh, fits into this equation. And you saw previously, the alkali metals are usually too small. And you see here as well, they are so small, they never form a black phase. They are simply outside of the correct range, even at very high temperatures, they don't go black. But then the question is maybe by adding rubidium in small quantities, they can become useful in the crystallization and formation of the perovskites. And so we started looking at it. And this put us in, in front of an interesting problem. So you, in all of these compositions, we fixed formamidinium because it's thermally stable and it has a beneficially redshifted band gap. And then we started adding systematically the other possible cations. But then, so we understood very well what happens when cesium is added, so we have a triple cation. But then when we add rubidium, what is the correct uh, approach? You know, and you see it here. Systematically, by adding rubidium, all of a sudden, we get more and more combinatorial possibilities. So we've reported all of these, and I won't get too much into the detail. Um, we, we looked into them, but then it turns out the triple cation worked well for us. This is the previous uh, sort of result that I've shown, and the quadruple worked for us as well. But there are many other rubidium-containing perovskites here as well. And this is interesting because it alludes to a wider principle of using combinatorials, combinatorics to create new materials. And just here also to quickly talk about the results as well, by adding rubidium to the triple cation mixture, we could show that uh, we achieve very high performances, but very importantly, the crystallization process improved such that a high voltage was achieved as well. And this is crucial for solar cells. Our very high voltage is indicative of uh, being relatively um, recombination-free, I mean, a non-radiative recombination-free material. And uh, this is a, a metric for the quality of the material in general. 
and it was a very low loss in potential, um, 390 milli electron volts. I even was very conservative with the band gap here, to be honest. I think it was lower. This was from electroluminescence. So it indicates this is comparable to silicon, but it also indicates that perovskites are more on the way towards gallium arsenide in terms of their potential. And this record has been broken since as well. Also, this is important because it highlights that this material certainly has to be a good LED material as well. Otherwise, you cannot reach such good uh, VOCs that we see it here in this video by operating the solar cell as an LED already at room conditions, room light conditions, we got very, very high like uh, and visible light under these ordinary uh, circumstances here as well. And again, this is sort of another statement to say that the VOC must be very high. And then, of course, the question is, what's the exact role of rubidium? And there are a few, a few stories of it. So it doesn't uh, go into the unit cell clearly. This has been known for a long time. That's also what we saw from this uh, yellow face. It never forms a black face on its own. Um, however, it changes the crystallization process dramatically. And also, it appears to uh, change the way distributed as well. This is an XPS study, which we've conducted at the time. You see how the rubidium um, on its own doesn't penetrate very deeply into the grain. Uh, but uh, And then in the presence of cesium, it starts interacting. Present, it seems more rubidium is going inside of the films as well. And this appears to, to have a passivation effect as well in the long run. So that's some, something resembling more uh, sort of CIGS where alkali metal uh, treatments are being used as well to passivate the, the, the crystal grains as well. But this is also an ongoing research topic at the moment as well. Then, of course, the very important topic of stability. So here, maybe two uh, quick sort of uh, results. First of all, uh, we found that metal, uh, the metal electrode seeps into the perovskite layer, degrading it uh, through the organic uh, HTM, a whole transporter material. And uh, one solution which we found in a smaller study was that a polymeric whole transporter could be a good way to prevent this. Mixing all the knowledge that we had from the previous talks, like the best uh, from the previous uh, sort of uh, results, the best perovskite, the best whole transporter, polymeric in nature, uh, we could show that um, even at 85 degrees, the perovskite uh, device was relatively stable because uh, it, we could prevent the metal electrode from going inside, indicating for us, and this was like a few years ago now, um, that, that the perovskite in principle can be stabilized at least uh, within this uh, sort of harsh uh, environment and that stabilizing the overall architecture. So, for example, the uh, whole transporter is an extremely important um, result or like... Um, optimization as well. So this uh, I've written up that in the future stability testing will be required as well. So we will need to find common standards on how to age uh, solar cells in order to study the degradation mechanism. We need standardized uh, sort of uh, aging data from the labs. And that's something that is very ongoing at the moment. One example I'd like to highlight, each material needs its own sort of specific protocol as well. For instance, because perovskites have this reversible loss component, it will be important in the future to take this into account for writing new aging standards for this uh, thin film technology. So then, of course, the question is, how far can we go with this? Can we go beyond 25.5% towards 30%? Uh, the answer is we need narrower band gaps. We need more controlled crystal growth and perhaps multi-junctions, I mean, which is a very obvious solution. It will be uh, one aspect of it as well. And now the question is, how uh, can we sort of Unlike silicon, where we only, yeah, which is still a lot, have doping, uh, like phosphorus or aluminium or uh, uh, boron, do we, what's the possibility to manipulate this material in a systematic fashion? And you saw it here. Already we have these four different components, and there are some more. But can this, uh, like how, how, how to mix materials together and, and how to generate new materials will be a theme in the future. And that's something I'd like to call like the Perovskite Genome Project. You see it here. And you, you've seen it being alluded to earlier, by adding rubidium naively, we could see that all these different components come out. And when I looked at it, I thought, this is something that is familiar to me, because it resembles this formula here, where choosing a unique set of K elements within a group of N. Yeah, this is something that we know from N over K, and it's nothing but the Pascal triangle, which we know from this A plus B to the power of N formula. But the coefficients, they express combinatorial possibilities. 
Yeah, so this is in the language of combinatorics. Uh, you know, you you sort of uh, draw from a pot of uh, of k ballots, let's say, or n ballots, uh, k elements, and then how many possibilities do you get when you do this, without uh, sort of reflecting on the order of them. So this is how the lottery uh, sort of uh, probabilities can be calculated as well. And um, so if you do that, you can see here for the four components, all of a sudden you end up here with this formula uh, here in the, the, the fourth uh, row of the Pascal triangle. And the interesting thing is the combinatorial possibilities, they increase exponentially. So you have two to the power of n minus one, the empty choice is subtracted possibilities as you add more and more component. And if you do this systematically, you see it here, four different cations, two metals, uh, three halides, you end up, and this is a conservative estimate with 651 unique uh, candidate compounds. Of course, you can also uh, sort of vary the ratio between them as well. And this spans the experimental parameter space. And even if you say, this is a lot uh, to take in, even if you say we will keep the form of medinium, um, still a lot of possibilities can be written down. And these are many, so I've written them down here. These are many different combinatorial possibilities. And uh, this is interesting. Let's say this is something for your information, something that can be looked at and it can be the, the basis for simulations, high throughput screening or machine learning in the future as well. Even if you simplify this list further, um, you can see it here, uh, methyl ammonium freeness, for example, could be a category as well. There are still many unexplored uh, compositions, and it'd be interesting to look at these in the future. In the supplementary information of this paper, I also uh, extended this list towards containing, uh, let's say, more exotic components. And there you end up with like tens of thousands of possibilities. So if you use europium or um, you use pseudo halides as well, or if you say that you want to look at the larger cations as well, all of a the sudden there are many possible com combinatorial possibilities. And these could be interesting for, for like a high throughput screening approach, which is uh, something that is highly relevant at the moment for, for many groups as well. And let me skip over this one. So I am here. So now the question is, we have all these different materials, how do we deal with them? And so this is a different topic now. Let's say you have 40,000 materials or whatnot. How, how do you deal with these materials? Because they come to you in often in, in an ink uh, shape, let's say. So they come as an ink and you need to crystallize them. So it means you have a liquid and you need to turn the liquid into a solid. And this is not easy. And that's a method we've developed here together with uh, Sandy Sanchez, who's now at EPFL and worked with me during my time at Fribourg. Um, there's this method where a very quick um, flash anneal can be used to crystallize the liquid, the semiconductor, into, into its solid state. And you see it here, it goes into the box, and then a very short flash of two seconds is sufficient to uh, conduct the entire crystallization. This method, rapid thermal annealing, is of course known from established technologies like silicon and so forth. Um, but instead of using one hour for the annealing time, it can be used here to sort of uh, control the crystallization. And you see here how the grains change dramatically. So this is to tell you that the heating protocol, so you, you may write down all the inks that there are in the world, but crystallizing them in a, in a systematic way is also very hard. And uh, this could be a tool to form or to control the crystallization in the future. Let me show you here a quick video. Yeah, no. Always when a video is shown, there is a balance. No, not today. Okay, so here you would have seen how the video makes the crystals emerge uh, so relatively spontaneously. Okay, so then I'll skip over this one here. And um, so another theme, so one question is, how do we grow a semiconductor film in a controlled fashion? And the answer has already been given by molecular beam epitaxy. But this, of course, is a very cumbersome process. And perhaps here we can use the advantages of this material being um, processed from solution and at the same time high quality. And here, this substrate is decorated with uh, gold nano uh, dots, let's say. 
And those have a chemical reaction, the gold surface with the perovskite precursor, you see it here. And uh, so it means that the crystallization of this liquid film is being seeded. The precursor adheres to these films and then it starts reacting. And this is used systematically to create the grains of these perovskites. And all of a sudden, although it's a solution processed material, the grains grow relatively systematically and have this hexagonal shape, which is something that we've uh, pre-patterned. So this is a way to induce the manipulation. Here in this video, you can see theoretically, at least, how the grains grow with this flash annealing method I've presented earlier. So here, very systematically. And this is something I think that could be a future direction as well, where we can use the advantages of solution processing with um, the, but, uh, but then uh, also control the, the grains as well. So we don't have to go for molecular beam acting. Um, so, yeah, going towards the end, let me just show you one last topic before I finish it. Uh, so, perovskites are not all about solar cells. X-ray detection could be interesting as well. So, one uh, important topic which came up recently are scintillators, where a high-energy photon is turned into a low-energy photon and then being detected, something that is used to detect, for example, radioactive uh, radiation. See it here, and this group from Singapore has gone through this very systematically. It's also used for medical imaging, for example. And why could be perovskites interesting? Because the scattering cross section increases with the atomic number, so the heavier the better. So Z equals 14, which is uh, silicon doesn't suit it. And here, all of a sudden, there's a unique advantage for, for perovskites. And as always, I haven't come up with this idea. If you want a new idea, you look into old papers. Um, a lot of it has been reported in the 2000s. You see here how these perovskites, 2D perovskites in that case, have been looked at for their um, scintillation properties. And um, of course, perovskites are, I think, a, a particularly fascinating material because the heavy elements are less problematic for scintillators. So let me go back here, for example, even thallium doping is used, which is highly toxic and so on, but it's used because it has this high Z number. It's very deep down in the periodic system. Uh, all the band gaps are all of a sudden possible. If you have like a gamma ray, it doesn't really care if the band gap is 1.5 or 3 electron volts. So this means we can go forward to, towards the inorganic perovskites. And then also the contact engineering is not such an important topic anymore because the crystal itself is the device. So this, I think, is an interesting sort of uh, possibility. And we started looking into perovskites in terms of the scintillation properties at low temperatures and going very low here, this black curve, compared to uh, green and red, which is cesium iodide or LYSO, these are established scintillators, shows that perovskites at um, nitro about nitrogen temperature can have a light output similar to commercial scintillators. And this is not even optimized yet, this methyl ammonium lead fibromide crystal. And this gives rise to the idea of cryogenic perovskite scintillators, for instance, for medical applications. And uh, let me just give you a table here. A good scintillator is uh, contingent on it having a high light out output, so it needs to create a lot of photons once a gamma ray is hitting it, and it needs uh, to also have a low dead time, so to speak. The decay time needs to be very, very high here, for example. And then forming the ratio of light yield divided by decay time, the higher this number is, the higher the possibility for the scintillator in terms of commercial application. You can see how perovskites have high promise, let's say, compared to commercial um, scintillators because they have both a short decay time and a high light output. And so maybe this could be a good possibility for future research, let's say. And mind you, this hasn't been even um, sort of optimized yet in terms of growing the crystal and so on. And now where could be the possible area of application? So nothing is more bitter in some ways than the photovoltaics optimization in terms of cost and benefit because everything is so cheap already and uh, established uh, photovoltaics is so um, I mean, that, that is silicon. I mean, it's, it's already so durable, 40 years, let's say, down the line. But there are speciality applications like these scintillators here, where here, this is a PET scanner, positron image, uh, emission tomography, uh, where this inner cladding of the wall is completely filled by uh, scintillation crystals, thousands of them, actually. And uh, the principle is you emit into the bloodstream uh, isotope, rubidium, for example, um, which emits positrons, okay? And then they react with the electrons in your body and they react more when there's an increased bloodstream for whichever reason. It could be cancer, for example, but also increased metabolism. And uh, you see here, the way it works is 
once you have a positron uh, electron um, annihilation, you send out two gamma rays in exact opposite direction because of the conservation of momentum. And once a signal comes on one side of the, of the tube, you know that on the opposite side, either before or afterwards, there must be another signal because of the physics. And then the time of difference is used to localize the original event. So this is the rough principle. Of course, you need to construct the electronics and everything, and it's not simple, but that's how it works in principle. And uh, in order to sort of uh, detect a gamma ray, which is 511 kilo electron, also relatively highly energetic, um, you need these scintillation crystals. And that's a possible application maybe by tuning it. And at the moment, there is actually a resolution limit for the scintillation uh, detector. And it'd be interesting to see in the future how we can um, implement it and how we can use this material for an, uh, for an application other than uh, solar cells. And that's something that we are very excited about in our research group. Yeah, and with that, I think it's a good point to finish and wrap up this talk. I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Um, thanks for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Michael, for this uh, overview. It was really nice. Um, I, uh, let's please stop sharing the screen. And okay. I would like to ask the audience um, if there are any questions. If there are any questions, please type it on the chat or you know, you can just switch on your microphone and direct the quest question to Michael. Until the questions they will come, I would, I, I, Michael, you know, I'm very glad that as a top expert in the field, you recognize that. And I totally agree with you that the, the most important I think applications or one of the most important applications will be the X-ray detection. Um, it, it contains all the characteristics and uh, also uh, covers, you know, all the disadvantages of the already existing technology. I, um, I would like to ask you something regarding, mm -hmm. of course, regarding the X-ray detection, we have two kinds of uh, architectures. You mentioned about scintillators, but also we have the direct detection. The main disadvantage with the scintillators is that you need another, another detector in order to yeah. capture you know, the photons. So why not direct detectors? And um, um, you just mentioned scintillators. The direct detection will be more straightforward. And if, of course, you can produce a single crystals with the appropriate uh, um, uh, length, because this is also important yeah. for the stopping power of the incoming gamma rays or X-rays or any high energy particles. So what is your opinion? Yeah, Costas already is the expert, uh, exactly. So for the photon uh, tube, um, you need many centimeters, actually. So it's a lot of effort um, to do it. So then the question is, why do, why do scintillators exist to start with? Yeah, so why do we use scintillators and not always direct? So the, the point is, if it penetrates very deeply into the material, and that's the case for high energy uh, photons or uh, gamma rays, and that's the case for uh, PET. Mm -hmm. 511 kilo electron volts will always penetrate very deeply into the material and the direct x-ray detector it means it's it's a solar cell after all right a direct x-ray detector instead of a photon from the sun it takes uh, a gamma ray which is also nothing but a photon of a very high energy um, but this means in a solar cell if it contained if it had to sort of detect um, a very high energy photon it, it, it means it goes very deep into it it means it needs many centimeters, perhaps even, to stop it and to resolve it to form the electron hole pair. And then th that electron hole pair has to be extracted as well. Now, it's one thing to have a diffusion length of many, many micrometers, but it's another thing to have it of many, many centimeters. So this means for the highest, uh, for the highest energy resolutions, uh, there is a space for scintillators where direct X-ray will not work very easily. Mm -hmm. So look at CERN, for example. But then, of course, for softer X-rays, I think that's interesting. There, I do agree with you that direct X-ray detection for perovskites could become interesting. So I feel perovskites can can sort of look at both angles here. And importantly, this is something that came came out through our research in the past years. This PET scanning is really used in the medical industry. It still has its place. There are millions of scans worldwide every year on this, and there is a resolution limit to it as well. The current um, scintillators cannot resolve very well, uh, or, or they cannot resolve better than two centimeters, one and a half centimeters, something like that, which is well enough. But if we could increase that resolution, we could also improve, um, let's say, the detection of early stage cancer as well. So there's a real benefit from it. It's not like the solar cell story, you know, where you try to make it cheaper, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
So, because in many ways, uh, we, we already have a very good product in silicon and the Perovskite is trying to boost it, but it's not that we are starting with nothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But for the, for the scintillator here, we could make like, let's say, the best material and, uh, because it doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. So we could beat LYSO. We cannot beat, for example, easily gallium arsenide with the Perovskite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I, I would like to highlight something on this. Um, it has a great impact, this kind of, that, uh, this ability for this kind of this material to detect and interact with high energy materials. Uh, there are recently a lot of publications regarding their, uh, the perovskite stability against this race. And this yes. shows like how they would like to transfer, you know, the solar harvesting to the space. I think that the whole research happens <laughs> in order to produce this um, high, how, how do they call it? High power, um, high efficiency, low weight, very yeah, high solar weight. cells in order to, mm. uh, I think that, you know, the whole technology go goes over there to combine the two, these two abilities uh, of this material. But, you know, you are much expert. Another thing that I would like to ask your opinion, I, I also totally believe that one of the most promising topics of the perovskites is also the lasers, since, you know, the lasing devices. Also, they show very promising results. And uh, also, as you said, you can control this direct bank up as you wish by the, of course, you know, the lead containment also affects, but I think that, you know, you are going to resolve it. Um, and my question for you is the following, as a, naive que uh, as a naive question from my side, is like you mentioned when you finished your PhD, it was like just one paper. Mm -hmm. Now we have like this amazing thing, seven accepted publications per day. Imagine how many papers they are submitted per day, if we have yeah. <laughs> papers per day. So I would like to ask you, why someone to get involved in the science since the competition is so high, the efficiency has reached such a high standards to be competitive with silicon. Why someone to invest money uh, in order to uh, mm. start a research in photovoltaics with such a competition? Mm. What is the, what is the, there is a limit somewhere, no? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question, of course. I mean, uh, let's say from like a broad semiconductor class, yeah, and semiconductor research is uh, sort of penetrating many different areas, chemistry, physics, uh, electrical engineering, material processing, you know, and I think so in, in many ways, the perovskites are very democratic and accessible, you know, so people can access it from many angles. It's not like a speciality skill, like the, the synthesis of a dye. Mm -hmm. So this is one answer to it. And the second answer is, um, so why should you move into it when the competition is so high? It's a bit like saying, why do you play football? Okay, a very popular sport. Um, and many people do it. So the competition is accordingly very high. Why don't you do something less, uh, less uh, popular, like take volleyball or something like that, right? But and, football, football is a product, it's not a research field. Yeah, but the question is in terms of the competition, yeah. right? And my point is when there is a lot of competition, when there are lots of good results, there's also a lot of funding accordingly and a lot, a lot of support. You know, becoming good in a niche is uh, more difficult in some ways than going into the mainstream. But of course, at the same time, then reaching the highest level is uh, accordingly challenging. In my opinion, it's the best thing that can and has happened to the field that, is, uh, that, uh, that it has broadened so much. If you have a speciality skill, it is very likely people haven't used it on this material group yet. And so by tapping into this resource of this extremely important material uh, for solar, for X-ray and so on, um, you, you, you sort of like highlight your own skill set, let's say. And that's what a lot of groups have done, have done. For example, there are many NMR experts and all of a sudden they have moved into the, the, these perovskite materials. But for them, it wasn't a big deal. It was just to use their skill on yet another material group. But their publications have gone into higher journals. And if you ask them, they say, it's not that like this is better research than the other research. It's just that this material is considered more important. So that's one aspect. And then secondly, I think uh, if you think uh, about like finding a niche, that there is always something here, you know. So, um, for for instance, uh, already people always say, "Well, it's too much. You cannot find your own way." Uh, this was in 2014 when the efficiencies were only at 20 percent. Then in 2016, 17, we started leaving the methyl ammonium out, for example, 
And then all of a sudden this became a huge direction in its own right as well, with like very high impact publications and everything. And now as well, I believe if you're creative and you read on it, you will find your own direction as well. Thank you. That's so a bit of a philosophical answer, perhaps. Yeah. Um, is there any question from the audience? Could I, could I ask something? Questions, please. Of course, George. Of course. Uh, I know very few things about uh, what you presented to us, which is very interesting. But uh, in this uh, uh, plot with the solar cell efficiency, uh, do we have a good microscopic understanding uh, of uh, you know how this uh, what is the physical mechanism that we can then you know try to improve, or is it just by trial and error? And in, in that uh, respect. Uh, do the perovskites uh, provide a, a good physical system uh, for, uh, you know, trying to, to use them in, in that respect? Yeah, this is a very important uh, question. Um, I would say it's, as always, it's a mixture. I mean, this is a, a line I, I am stealing from Federico Capasso from Harvard. Um, you know, textbook research or textbooks, they, they show a very sanitized version of research. Yeah, so often trial and error is a starting point, then the theory comes in and it goes back and forth over a few decades and then somebody writes it into the textbook and then it looks very clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they show the graphic and everybody thinks it's clear now. Somebody was sitting at the desk coming up with the theory and then the experiment was fitting it. When in reality, uh, it's a back and forth, a bit like an electromagnetic wave, you know, first this, then that, and it propagates in this way. Um, and I would say for the perovskites, a lot of it has been driven at the beginning with trial and error, I would say. And also its discovery for uh, solar cell properties was, I think, um, yeah, a stroke of genius, as they say. Yeah, like a stroke of art, perhaps. Who knows? You know, it was used as a dye for the dye sensitized solar cells. And then, you know, people were saying, hold on a second, this could be a semiconductor in its own right. And then in terms of how to improve it, I think some of it, of course, was to try it, but then with intuition as well. So for example, this mixing approach, there was some intuition in terms of saying, well, there's this tolerance factor. Instead of using all the elements in the periodic system, maybe some of them are more promising than the others. So it's an educated guess, let's say. So this is one aspect of it. And then second, now we are using many strategies, I would say, from the organic electronics, like passivation interface uh, strat uh, strategies. You know, um, can we put uh, organic overlayers to uh, passivate some of the broken bonds on the surface. And I think for this, it has been an excellent toy system for many groups uh, that are specialized on surface science in the past as well. And my belief is now that we have conquered the 25 point something percent barrier, that we will have to become more and more systematic here as well. So the, the rest, if you if you really want to reach like gallium arsenide at 29 percent, will be a lot of uh, sort of basic research as well. Do we believe that there is an upper bound in this efficiency or can, can it get as, as high as we, I mean, 100%? Well, I mean, there is the shockley quasar limit, so you cannot be more than 33% uh, because of the shape of the solar spectrum. And um, so if the sun had only one frequency, we wouldn't exist, but the solar cells would be very efficient. Um, but uh, uh, so 33%. And then for the perovskites, their upper bound is um, also close to the theoretical maximum in terms of its potential. And in my opinion, they have all the physical properties of gallium arsenide. Uh, or to put it uh, in the opposite way, in my opinion, there is no reason yet in terms of the chemical and physical properties why they cannot have the properties of gallium arsenide. And this means, I believe, Okay, this is a big statement, but I believe perovskites have all the properties at this time. Uh, no, uh, if you have other evidence, this is a different story to become the first material to reach uh, thirty percent plus. Whether this, if you reach it, whether this is a commercial product or not, is a completely different question. But in my opinion, they have all the properties, and this will drive the field for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George, for the question and Michael for the answer. Are there any questions? And Michael, you mentioned something that you, the competitor is the silicon, but what about organic solar cells? You know, since you know their efficiency is getting rising, rising again. What is your opinion? Do you? 
I mean, organic, uh, I think the records have been mainly by multi junctions as well. Um, I'm not sure. It's, you know, it's hard to predict the future, right? Uh, maybe the organics have also other advantages, let's say they, they are more flexible in terms of solvent systems and so on. Uh, they are more colorful, you know, you have this kind of uh, situation, perhaps, although this is also given with perovskite. Um, I, I mean, okay, if you want to sort of penetrate the market on a global scale, you need high performances. Mm -hmm. And having higher performances for uh, uh, organic photovoltaics is one aspect, but you need to have like, on a lab scale, at least 25% plus and, and so on. You know, even putting the material for free on top of silicon, maybe not enough. That's the crazy thing, right? Because silicon is so cheap now. So one square meter of uh, crystalline silicon, yeah, perfect uh, crystal grid, right, is 15 euros. It's cheaper than, I don't know, uh, like a like a special uh, tile on your kitchen. And that's, I mean, that's what we have to deal with now. Yeah. Silicon has become so cheap that all the other technologies uh, have like a problem to justify their existence now. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, any questions? So if this is the case, I would like to thank you, Michael, again for your kind contribution. Um, it, as I told you, it was an honor for all of us, for our community of this iCafe to have you with you. <laughs> I hope that we will meet again, you know, very soon in Crete. Uh, for two weeks, but not for lectures, you know, just to yeah. have fun. I'm pretty sure that Kimakis is organizing this uh, conference, pretty soon with Stratakis, and uh, you will join us, but not only for this reason, but for vacations in the Czech Republic. No, no, that would be my pleasure. We'll be very happy to have you again. So, thank you. To... Yes, please, Mike. No, no, thank you so much. It, it's been my honor. I, I'm always very glad to, to be with you, and I hope also I can visit soon in person again. Okay, thank you. Thank all of you. And then we will come back with the, next, with the next Colloquia Talks next week or in two weeks' time. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.